Hello and welcome to Raw Live, where your opinion matters. Whether you're watching on Facebook, Raw TV, or listening to the podcast on iTunes, thank you so much for joining us. My name's Rudin Lee. Oops, sorry, I shouldn't whack the mic like that. On my right, it's Daniel Jeffrey, uh, and on the phone is Cam Rose, um, our resident Raw AFL expert and shameless Richmond Tigers fan. Cam, good to catch you in a good mood before your team inevitably comes crashing down to earth in a few days' time. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. <laughs> so a shameless Richmond supporter. So does that imply that anyone who does break Richmond should be carrying a shame around their neck or something like that, does it? I'm not saying that, but I am nodding on screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, today we've got um, three main questions that we're going to be approaching. We've got, we're five rounds into the AFL season. There's been a few surprise packets. Um, Jefferson, I actually swan supporter, so we should be hanging our heads in shame more than you can. There, there is shame. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is <laughs> so we're going to be talking about what the hell has happened to the Swannies and the Hawks. Secondly, um, are Richmond and Adelaide the real deal? Um, they've obviously got their big game coming up on Sunday, so we'll deal with that. Um, and obviously Cam will be, I'm sure, has some opinions on that. And finally, we're going to be awarding the round five Brownlow and reverse Brownlow for the most impressive and least impressive players of the season so far. But let's start with the Swannies and the Hawks. Um, both teams, I mean, we're used to just them being perenni- perennially at the top of the table. It's always just a given. Um, and now suddenly the Swans find themselves 0-5, Hawks 1-4. and um, Cam, what's, what's all gone so wrong? with the? Let's start with the Swans. Well, I think it's both connected, actually, with these two teams. And it's a similar story at both clubs. And the, the answer is, sort of lies in the question there in terms of the perennial contenders that they've been. And so what's happened is for both sides, they've both hit the season, the early part of the season, with senior players out of form and badly out of form in some cases. And what we're also seeing is by virtue of being up the top for so long, these these clubs don't get to expose a lot of uh, depth players to the club. So when they are struggling and that their time is to step up, these second, third, fourth tier players, they haven't been able to do so. And in fact, in both on both sides of the fence there, some of the younger players have actually had quite bright seasons. And it's actually been that senior leadership groups that have fallen away. And I think that's what we're seeing with those two. So they've been a victim of their own success, which is exactly what the AFL competition is designed to have happened to those clubs that have been up at the top for a long time. Which uh, senior players are you most disappointed with? So I think if we're looking for at a Hawthorne perspective, it's you know the interesting factor here is that Tom Mitchell has probably been Hawthorne's best player overall, and he was obviously new to the club. I think guys that have certainly let them down have been you know Isaac Smith, Liam Shields, looking at Jack Gunston, Sue Royale certainly, obviously came good on the weekend, and a number of those guys did come good. Cyril in particular had some highlights, but these guys certainly haven't been uh, carrying the can as, as was expected to happen. Ben McAvoy has been disappointing in the ruck. I know he's not one of the league's great ruckmen or anything like that, but he's been a really ineffectual and, and had no presence. Uh, Paul Piopolo is probably a victim of more of that small forward role. He's, he's been struggling back games. Grant Birchall's been missing with a broken jaw, but was only just going before he went out. Uh, and then you've got the... Uh, Key forward. So Ty Vickery clearly was been dropped, came over to Hawthorne. A lot of people expected them to have be successful again and Vickery to be a part of that. And Jordan Roughhead. Now, you know, obviously he gets a little bit of an out having missed last year with cancer, having 12 months off footy, but he's been really struggling to, to get in the game as well. So it's a real, it's a real, that senior core of Hawthorne players have disappointed. Jeffers, what about the Swans for you? you I know you're a rabid Swans fan as well. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you've watched most of the games. Who, who's been really disappointing from your perspective? Well, I think it's that midfield group that we've become so accustomed to them dominating ga- games. Obviously, uh, Cam mentioned Tom Mitchell, now with the Hawks. Yeah. That's a big loss. But guys, um, uh, who am I thinking of? Luke Parker, Luke Parker is yeah. the one. And Dan Hanabry. Um, So often they were game breakers for the Swannies last year, whether it was through their outside run, their inside contested ball wins, or from hitting the scoreboard. And they haven't really been that impressive this year. I mean, uh, Josh Kennedy has been, as usual, carrying a massive load for the Swans. And with Mitchell out, he hasn't really had the help that he's accustomed to, and that's seen the Swans really struggle this year. Yeah, it's a worrying sign, especially with with Hanabry and Parker, who should be right about in their prime or just approaching it. And this is where you really expect them. You know, a lot of people had, I know Parker especially, um, as a hot tip for Brownlow. Uh, he just hasn't had the presence. And I don't understand why he's... I saw him on the week. He's massive. He's, a tiny, he's like just a smaller version of Josh Kennedy. It's not, it's not a fitness problem. Um, and that's, that's genuinely worrying. And I feel like this one should have 
even though they lost Mitchell, I mean, they should have. You look at that list. I mean, that, there's enough depth there to, to cover Tom Mitchell. Um, it's been... Well, I mean, but, um, yeah, I think it would be doing the Swans a disservice to not mention the injuries they have had. I, it's not a complete excuse, but when you're missing guys like Kurt Tippett, uh, Dane Rampey in particular, I think he's been a massive out. And Isaac Heaney, who many people were predicting to kind of step up and uh, carry a lot of that midfield burden that Mitchell's absence was going to leave, he's been injured as well. So though missing those players has hurt them a lot. I think there's a, a fair bit of connection there as well. So, you know, Tom Mitchell being out means that that's one le- and, and Isaac Heaney as well, who both sort of played midfield forward roles, Luke Parker as well in the, in the last couple of years. So with Mitchell now gone, Heaney hasn't been playing. So all of a sudden Parker can't get forward as much anymore. So, you know, he's only kicked one goal from five games. when I mean, he's been a goal a game player and he can often kick multiple goals. And so, but you've also got on, on the flip side of that. So yes, Kurt Tippett has been missing, but Sam Ray, Reed has played better football than anyone could have expected and kicked more goals than was expected of him. Jake Lloyd has seen his game go to another level. He had a very strong back end of last year. And yep. though even though some of Rampy's drive has been missing, Jake Lloyd has picked up a little bit of slack. So has Zach Jones. He's had it been impressive as well. But I think it all just reaches a critical mass when you are missing too many of those players and, and there's too many young guys left to carry the can. And they just can't play four quarters. And that's been Sydney's problem. They've been good for two three and three quarters in their matches, but it's just one quarter that's letting them down each time. Great 20 minutes, great 10 minutes to start the game last week and then... Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> as soon as I turned on the telly to watch the Swans, they... <laughs> You're the curse, They um, conceded nine straight goals. That was, <laughs> that was bad. Uh, I've got some comments rolling in about this topic um, on Facebook Live and on the Raw. Uh, Tony Pemberton and Dylan Ellis have both blamed um, injuries on the, uh, for the Swannies. And Cam, you've written a piece uh, you last week, almost a week today, um, sort of saying the Swans can't blame... Uh, injuries on their... I can't blame our current results on the injuries. Um, no. Yeah, that's right. And that is, and that is again, because I don't think the injury list is that extreme. As I say, okay, so Tippett's been out, but Sam Reid has plugged that gap. Um, Dane Rampey's been out. Zach Jones is certainly having his... played his best patch of footy that he's had, and Jake Lloyd has picked up some of that slack as well. So, And it's not so much the injuries... As in, you don't lose, you know, when, when you lose a Dane Rampey or a, or a Kurt Tippett um, and Isaac Heaney, you know, you're not just replacing them with nothing. It's not as if Sydney has 15 or 16 players out on the ground. Um, so it's that's when that impact, that depth is impacted. So, you know, how different would it be if Tim Membry was still at Sydney, for instance? Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously when I wrote that article, there's a whole host of players who have had to be let go. You know, Shane Mumford, with Tippett out, for instance, Shane Mumford was still there, he'd be able to play in the ruck. So it's a, it's all gets connected back a little bit to Buddy and Tippett and the amount of big dollars that sort of they came in on and therefore some depth players had to get squeezed out and, and some of whom end up becoming very good players at other clubs. Jeffers, um, if the Swans and Hawthorne, if their leadership group step up, they start playing well, they've both got uh, a pretty easy run for five or so games. I guess, do, the, do either of them have a chance at playing finals? Yeah, absolutely. I mean... Big difference between this year and last. Last year we kind of saw the top eight and one or two other sides and then there was a big gap. And so you kind of had your final set pretty early on in the season. We don't have that this year. I mean, we've got a couple of sides that are 5-0. But um, at the moment, I think it's Fremantle in that eighth spot at Mm. the moment. Um, Like, I think Swans are three or four games out of the finals. Hawthorne, obviously, one game fewer than that. It's not that big of a gap to bridge for them at the moment. And with the quality of players they have in the side, um, obviously the kind of culture of success both teams do have, I, I don't think it's right for us to write them off as finals chances at the moment. Well, uh, speaking of finals chances, I think let's pivot to two teams who we expect now probably to go quite deep in the finals. Um, Adelaide 0-5, Richmond 0-5. Richmond, I think, third just behind Geelong on the ladder. Um, I don't know. Five and oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah come <laughs> on. <laughs> it's a, yeah, we're, we've worked hard. We've never had five wins in a row in my life. Now you're taking it away from me. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, let's just start with you, Cam. Um, Richmond, are they, are they the real deal, or are you guys going to slot back to your um, little home position that ninth on the ladder by the end of the season? Yeah. See, we need to let's okay, let's get rid of uh, a furphy for a start. So Richmond, I think, has finished ninth maybe once in the last ten years. Like North, 
has finished ninth three times in that period. Uh, so, you, you, you know, you're still hear the jokes about ninth men, but we don't call them ninth Melbourne or anything like that. It's not so, as funny for some reason. Ninth I know, Melbourne. yeah, you're not funny. <laughs> I, I don't know. You can tell that one's been eating away at me, but uh, <laughs> I think it, it all depends on how do we define the real deal. So are we talking about top finish four? or are we talking about finals? So from a, I think from a Richmond perspective, you know, I don't think anyone is thinking premierships, but... If they, they're entitled to be thinking finals, and let's not forget, you know, Richmond had a down year last year, but they did play finals the previous three years and finished fifth on the ladder twice in that time. So we're not talking about a bad football side here. We're talking about a side that had a bad year. And we can possibly go back to Geelong, who were the last flag side to win um, a, a premiership despite not playing finals the year before. So that does give, uh, you know, back in, they missed finals in 06 after playing finals in 05 and 04. And so, you know, there might be some hope there for Tiger fans if they can emulate the Geelong uh, of 2007, although that is a very tall order. What have you liked um, most about Richmond in their first five games of the season? Yeah, so it's, for me, it's been clearly the uh, ability to apply pressure that uh, has been clearly the number one focus over the off-season. It's something that has been lacking in Richmond has been criticised for in the past, and they've injected some real speed into the game. And, yeah, much has been made of the three small forwards, Castagna, Butler and Rioli, and they've all added something. And they all, you know, some they've all had a couple of quiet games, but they've all also stepped up in big moments, and, they, and they've been able to put the score on the board, which has been fantastic. And also that ability to rotate midfielders through the forward line. And we're talking about Dustin Martin, Trent Gotchin, Sean Grigg, Dion Prestia, and Josh Caddy have also spent some time down there. So all of a sudden, Richmond went into the the year with a big question mark over their forward line, and outside Jack Rewalt, what else do they have? And we've seen some really creative coaching and some, some focus, I guess, from Damien Hardley. And this is the results that we're seeing before us. I think we saw with the Bulldogs, especially last year, how valuable it can be to have midfielders and forwarders who, forwards uh, sorry, who can rotate through. Um, and Richmond are really noticeably quicker this year uh, watching their games. They're, they've got a lot more zip than I've, I've can't remember in, you know, I guess the yeah, last year. Yeah, and one of Damien Hardwick's things, and I've been writing about this for a couple of years, funnily enough, and, and Hardwick said that, over the preseason, their focus was to actually just relax a little bit, and he felt that they were overcoaching, and the players were suffering from a little bit of paralysis by analysis, and they decided, you know what, these guys get on an AFL list because they've got talents and they've got skills, so how about we utilise them and let them just play the game and let them play to their instincts a little bit more, and you're seeing, I think, a team that is really thriving under that, uh, I guess, that guidance. Jeffers, how do you think uh, Richmond are going to fare by the end of the season? Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that they're not going to be able to keep up this current level of undefeatedness. Um, <laughs> if you look so far, they, they have had a, a pretty easy draw so far in that they, they've played teams like Carlton, like Brisbane, uh, West Coast at the MCG. I mean, West Coast, obviously, a very good side, but going to the MCG is just a death wish for them, yeah. or has been in recent times. Um, the real test of for the Tigers is going to come in the next five weeks. They've got the Crows in Adelaide this week, obviously. They've got the Bulldogs at Etihad Stadium next week. Um, Frio make the trip over to play them after that. And then I believe they have GWS in Sydney and then Essendon. That's a much tougher run of games and we're going to really see where this side stacks up. For mine, I think they're a final side, but one that's in the not in the top four. Sure. How about I think what we're sorry. seeing, sorry, just before we get to Adelaide, I think what we're seeing this year as well, which is, makes it a, a bit easier for a side like Richmond to have top four aspirations, is that there, there does, uh, doesn't seem to be the depth. Last year we did see seven or eight very good football teams and the final eight was decided. So the fact that this does look a more even year means, you know, Adelaide and GWS are two that we can probably lock away. Uh, Geelong uh, are obviously looking right up there as well. But that fourth spot could be anyone at this stage. So that gives Richmond supporters a lot of hope. Absolutely. Jeff Sydney supporters. Some hope as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, Adelaide, Jeff. Yes, yeah. they're quite good. They're good, aren't they? Yeah, they're they very are good. good. I mean, they're, they're one of those sides um, you probably wouldn't have penciled into your top four at the start of the year. I know I certainly didn't. And I, I mean, they've kind of always had this incredibly talented forward line with yeah. guys like Walker, Josh Jenkins, Eddie Betts is leading the Coleman right, race yeah. at the moment. <laughs> and does it in spectacular style. Um, have some good defenders. Uh, Daniel Talia is obviously the main one around, uh, around back for Adelaide, but they've got a very good supporting cast for him. The question marks coming into the season were around their midfield. Could they win enough ball to get it? 
uh, up forward? Could they win enough ball to stop other teams going on the run against them? And their midfield group has really stepped up this year. I mean, Rory Sloan's the obvious example of that. Uh, but his teammates have been huge as well. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're the form team of the comp. I don't, they go in as favourites against Richmond, and rightly so. And, um, yeah, they're looking like serious September threats at the moment. Are they a grand final team, Cam? Well, they're certainly playing grand final football, uh, but it is April, so and that's <laughs> yeah. very tough to sustain uh, for the next five or six months. So there's no doubt that Adelaide will be having a dip, and, and certainly I'll be hoping that it happens uh, on Sunday. But they, uh, they, it's, it's tough, too tough to sustain this sort of form. So, But what this does do, by building a platform of early wins, it means that they can absorb a lull if there does happen to be one in June or July. And in some ways, they will train for a lull so that they can then come out of it and then peak uh, again. And we remember, we go back all the way to 97 and 98, when uh, Neil Craig was the fitness coach at Adelaide, and it was, a lot was made of the fact that you know Adelaide weren't the best side across those 22 rounds, but they really did peak in September in those years, just like the Bulldogs did last year. So that's something certainly to keep in mind. And uh, But look, they are they're just playing outstanding football. And it's worth remembering, too, Going into round 23 last year, Adelaide was second on the ladder. Mm-hmm. So, yes, they, then that, that fateful loss to West Coast uh, in the yeah, last right, round meant yeah. they tumbled down to fifth and then they won their elimination final and then went out the next week. So, but they were second on the ladder after 22 rounds last year. So, I think we all sort of forgot that when we did our pre season projections, yeah. but this is a seriously uh, good football side. All right. Um, I completely agree. I don't really have anything more to add <laughs> Adelaide. They're outstanding. Um, they're well beyond sort of where I thought they would go, I didn't think that the way they played was sustainable to counter-attack um, to constantly keep that up. But they find a way to do it every single week, so I'll eat my words. And they've been doing it with a few injuries as well. I mean, I don't think Scott Thompson's played a game no, yet. No, He's kind of been one of the stalwarts for that club in recent years, one of their key midfield performers. He comes back into the side. You would imagine they're only going to get strong with that. I mean, uh, happy days yeah. if you're an Adelaide supporter. Brad Krause just played his first game oh, on the weekend. Exactly yeah, right. Peeled off 33 touches. And Josh Jenkins has missed three games. Mitch McGovern's missing games. So, and this also, if we relate that back to Sydney earlier, I think Adelaide's injury list has been worse than Sydney's, yet Adelaide is sitting 5-0, Sydney is 0-5. So that's where, to me, and the difference uh, between the two is. All right, well, let's drill down into um, individual players now. Um, we've arbitrarily made an award called the Round 5 Brownlow and Reverse Brownlow. The Brownlow, Round 5 Brownlows, who's been the most impressive or best player, in your opinion, uh, for the first five rounds? Reverse Brownlow is who's been either the worst player or the least impressive player, most disappointing player for you. Um, I guess if Zach Dawson still played, he'd be the perennial (laughs) favourite for this one, but alas, we haven't got um, him to rag on anymore. Um, Cam, do you want to start us off? Who's been your favourite player so far? Uh, yeah, again, look, I think we've spoken about Adelaide. To me, it has to be Rory Sloan at this stage. Sure. Uh, he, uh, the thing about Rory is that he had a really quiet end to last year. We know, he, I think he only averaged about 20 touches in his last four games, and you know, two of those were finals, obviously, and he missed that round 23 game through suspension. So, uh, you know, I think he's, the way he's attacked this season is if he's got a real point to prove, and I think he's been doing that. You know, he's hitting the scoreboard regularly. He's breaking up the touches. I mean, look at his last four games, tackles. 15, 9, 9, and 13. So this bloke wow. is ferocious uh, without the ball and clearly doing great things with the ball. Jeffers, how about you? I echo Cam's thoughts. Ah. And, and I, <laughs> I had written it down on my notes before, so I'm not just piggybacking on these excellent <laughs> ideas. But yeah, Sloan's been uh, incredible. Add to the fact that the brown line often goes to a, the kind of star midfielder from one of the top four teams. Um, Sorry, with Paddy Dangerfield last year, obviously. Sloan's playing uh, a different role to what Dangerfield is, but no less as impactful. I mean, um, he's tackling his leading, uh, equal leading tackle maker in the competition, I believe, at the moment, with 50 from five rounds. I mean, that's, those are big numbers. He's uh, scoring a goal a game. He's around 28, 29 disposals a game, and more than 50% of them are contested disposals. And his team's won five games. I don't, I don't see how you can look at any other player. Jeffers, how about those stats? No, very well done. Up. Yeah, well, I've really no got, notes as I've well. I've only got one for Eddie Betts, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who is my favourite, because he scored. I think it's three point eight goals a game. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's my that's my one stat. Um, and it's I think he's stat. about sixteen disposals every game. But it's the manner in which he does it. There's such exciting goals, and it's such a difficult role 
to kick consistently and take so many, uh, consistently kick goals um, as a small forward and to take so many marks in the forward 50 that he seems to do for such a, a small and sort of seemingly unimposing figure. Um, so Eddie Betts is mine. How about reverse Brownlow for you, Camp? Yeah, tough one. I sort of chewed over this and I, th- I started, I, I looked at Sydney and Hawthorne here given that the poor start and the fact that I felt that it was the leaders that was letting them down. So I'm going to go with Cyril Rioli and Luke Parker. And we spoke about Parker earlier, guys. And I'm going to go with those two uh, equal here in that I, I think they've been symptomatic of the poor seasons that their teams have had. And these are two, you know, genuine superstars of the competition coming into this year. I think they were both uh, were in the top sort of 15 or 20 in the raw top 50 that we do every year. And much was expected. And I felt that they've really let their side uh, with having their minimal impact on games. Jeff, how about you? I'm going to look at North Melbourne, another uh, 0-5 team. And say, I often forget there's another one. Yeah, I know. Um, I'd like to remind our AFL guru, uh, Josh Elliott, of that one. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Josh. Um, I'm going to say Andrew Swallow. Because, uh, I mean, he, he hasn't been great last year. Uh, but he's a former captain of the Kangaroos, and he just, just hasn't been good enough. Uh, we've seen they've, they've tried moving him around. Uh, the park a bit because he's traditionally been that gutsy, hard tackling inside midfielder that they're moving around, him around a bit and at the moment kind of indicates that he's not doing that well enough um, but you know they've thrown him up forward a bit and uh, I went hard with the stats on Rory Sloan I'll give you a stat for Andrew Swallow he's kicked one goal seven since round one of 2016 um, Indeed, yes. Yeah, that, that's not yeah. a great stat if you end your solo. But. No, no, not really. So yeah, he <laughs> he gets my reverse brown low because he, he just I don't see what North are getting from him at the moment. And the other thing, just quickly on Swallow as well, like there's been a couple of games. His percentage time on ground at the moment has been yeah a couple of times hovering in the low sixties, and that so he's he's not getting the ball, but he's not impacting games. He's not demanding that he be on the ground. So Brad Scott is leaving him on the bench for long periods. And I'm going to go, as you probably realised, I'm all about low-hanging fruit, cheap Richmond jokes to start off the, <laughs> to start off the show. So I'm going to keep that thing going with Ty Vickery, um, where Eddie Betts has 3.8 goals per game. Ty Vickery has 3.7 kicks per game, uh, which is translating to 0.3 of a goal per game, uh, which aren't great numbers uh, for a forward, um, coming on with about two marks as well. And he just... He thought maybe a new environment, Hawthorne, but maybe he could he could show that potential that his athletic body seems to <laughs> seem that he has. But um, yet again, I think we've all kind of been disappointed by Ty. Hopefully, he can turn it around. But I mean, man, I don't know. I haven't been that disappointed because yeah. I tend to not mind seeing Hawthorne lose. Right, being yeah, a sure. really petty <laughs> and insecure Sydney Swans fan, but yeah, he he hasn't been great thus far. Um, a couple of messages coming in on Facebook Live. Uh, Kane Reynolds has thrown Joel Selwood's hat in the ring for, I think, for, for Brownlow. Is that, I yeah, guess it would have been. Right. Yeah. I and I, if we were going to be doing a 3 2 and 1, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Joel Selwood would have been my number two, I think. Uh, you know, not necessarily stepping out of Paddy's shadow, but uh, you know, the, the whole Danger Wood thing has been overdone, and, and I think Paddy's Brownlow and everything like that. Like, I seriously hope Joel Selwood can win a Brownlow because someone was more deserving. And, uh, and he has just been simply outstanding. And, you know, he's a top five, ten player in the game in his own right. Let's not forget that. Sure. Um, I think, yeah, later into the season he'll kick in. Yeah, he gets the get job done. He's a exactly. terrific player. And finally, Toby, Pem- Toby Pemberton has said, uh, Jones and Lloyd have been amazing. I s- a few Jones and Lloyds floating around in the AFL. Yeah. I, I would <laughs> cast a guess that he's a Sydney fan. Yes. And, yes. and neither of those guys deserve to be in the Brownlow conversation yet. I agree. Sorry, guys. All right. Uh, We'll be back straight after this very quickly with a super quick quiz and then we'll wrap up. That is an excellent question. That is an excellent question. That's an excellent question. (sighs) Hey, that's a good question. All righty, Cam. Final segment, Raw Live Quiz. Uh, Three questions. Say your name if you know the answer. That'll be your buzzer. Jeff, as you know the drill. All righty. Let's go. Who has the most total clangers for season 2017 so far? Cameron. Camp. I'm going to guess Dusty Martin. Ooh, no, but similar echelon of players. Okay, Dangerfield. Paddy Dangerfield. Yeah. Well done, Jeffers. That's a tricky one. Um, <laughs> 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 um, question number two. 
When was the last time Ty Vickery was part of a winning football team? A game. And you can say a round or date. Or oh, month. Mo- you can say month, maybe, because it's pretty a hard. month. Daniel? Dan- I'll go... Was he part of that uh, Richmond win against Sydney, which kind of broke my heart a bit last year, where Jake Floyd kicked a goal on the... What I'm date assuming was that? he would have been playing in that. I, I cannot tell you the Wait. date. I'm pretty sure it wasn't late season. Okay, mid season. All right, no, that's they've had a they had a lateish one, Cam. Yeah. Cameron, uh, it will be the win against Collingwood last year. Bingo, that's, that's correct. 20. August five, well done. Um, so yeah, almost coming into <laughs> coming into a year for Ty. If you oh, want. come on, he's got he's <laughs> got a <like>, year. <laughs> he's got four months. Yep. Yeah. that's a lot of footy. <laughs> um, and finally. Uh, the Swans and 0-5 team are coming up against Carlton. What are their odds to win this game? Jeffers. Jeffers. I reckon about a dollar twenty. Cam? Uh, I'll be going maybe a dollar eighteen, something like that. Yep. Jeffers, you had it spot on. Uh, from the from the really? one from the uh, from the agency <laughs> I looked at, it was one dollar twenty. Someone's an addicted gambler here. Aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Jeffers, well done. Two one. Sneaks through. Cam, thank you so much That's for good. your insights. It was a blast having you on. Thanks, guys. It's been great uh, great being on. And uh, go Tigers on Sunday, I'm telling you. We will give this one a shake. I, don't, I reckon Crazy got yeah. <laughs> Jeff, yeah. <how> you. <laughs> I, I, I just want to watch the game of footy because I reckon it's going to be an absolute belter. It will. I can't wait. Um, see you guys. Thanks for all your comments. Toby, Kane, everyone getting involved. Thank you so much. We'll see you again next week. Cheers. Cheers.